I don't know if this is on, but I'm really loud, so I'll just pray loudly. <laughs> I guess it is. Okay. Father God, thank you for the ability to gather here for you. Um, thank you for this country that you've given us that is free and help us to keep going. And then uh, Tina's going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance here. Yes, this is Tina. <laughs> All right, let's find the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yes, and I just wanted to give a special shout out to State Representative Mike Neerman for doing this for us. It is not every day that we get a state representative to take this much time out of their very, very busy schedule, particularly right now with session just a little over a week away. So I see we just give it up for Rep. Neerman. <laughs> Some people that really deserve some uh, commendation too is Mindy Knapp, who put this all together. And I think that's very good. So I think there's a good job. And then I'm very grateful to the People's Church for having us. This is a great facility and they're really great to invite us in here. And Casey is uh, I'll be forever indebted to him. This is the guy with no technical uh, hiccups here or back here. So uh, um, if he can put that together, uh, it truly does make me believe in God, right? <laughs> 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 so, uh, anyway, so um, I'll get started here. One thing I want to start with is, uh, um, is so uh, some of you last week got a copy of the Constitution. I, I don't have any more of those. I ran out of those, which is probably a good thing. John brought his back there. He's going to... He's gonna, um, Whatever, he's going to try and stump me or something like that. But, but the Oregon Constitution changes a lot. Uh, the U.S. Constitution doesn't change that much. When was the last time the U.S. Constitution changed? Does anybody remember? 1992, I believe. And uh, that, was, that was an amendment from way back in the 1800s. It was the 27th Amendment. And it says that you, if... if Congress gives itself a raise that that raise can't go into effect until after we've had an election there. So it's just some amendment that was just hanging around and needed some states, enough states to ratify it. And Michigan came along and said, well, we could be the last state here and they ratified it and that was enough to put it over. And that was the 27th Amendment. I think that was 1992. Someone can check me on that. But uh, anyway, the Oregon Constitution changes almost every two years. That's the, that's the opportunity we have to put things on the ballot every two years. The, the legislature can put things on the ballot. Uh, we can pass a, a bill to put things on the ballot. And then the, the people can put things on the ballot. But the only, the only entity that can change the Oregon Constitution is you, the people, at the ballot box. So if you want to get a copy of the Constitution, that copy that John has is already out of date. It's um, the changes are minor in it, so it's not a big deal, but uh, it's already out of date. But if you want a good one here, if you go to OregonLegislature.gov, and you probably have been to this page here, don't go to Olus there. I know that's where you want to go, really. But if you go to Bills and Laws there, and then uh, if you go down in here, it says Oregon Constitution. If you click on that, then you have, a, this is the Oregon Constitution here, right? And um, you can scroll down here and... Uh, uh, that's the Oregon Constitution right there that's going by. The cool thing about having it online is you can do a word search, right? If you do control F, you can uh, search for uh, emergency, uh, right, or whatever you want to search for. And then if you're looking for, like, emergency clause or something like that, you can do that. But uh, anyway, so that's the, uh, that's the, uh, um, that's where you find the Oregon Constitution. All right. All right. <laughs> okay, 
Um, so, uh, so, we, so we, uh, last last or two weeks ago, we went over the uh, the first part of the Constitution. It's a pretty important part. It's the Bill of Rights there, and um, so we talked a lot about rights. So today we're going to talk about the branches of government. And if you studied civics, if you're awake in civics back in tenth grade or whatever, something like that, you probably hopefully know that you at Morgan had the, the, the government. There's three branches of government. There's the legislative, the judicial, and the executive. We all learned that and everything. Well, in Oregon, it's not quite so neat and tidy as that. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. So the first branch of the government, and it's the same in the federal constitution, is the first branch of the government that's talked about is the legislature. In Oregon, it is too, because that's kind of the start of things. So let's say if we were just like wipe out the state of Oregon and start over legally, right? So we would start and we'd have, so here's the state of Oregon, and we would, first thing we would do is we'd have a constitution, which is some basic rules on how we run our state and everything. And then we would um, uh, then we'd say, okay, well, we don't we don't have to do anything. There's a, there's a few things that we have to do based on the constitution. We have to have elections, for instance, or something. We don't have to build any roads. We don't have to build any prisons. You're guilty of murder. That's fine. I sentence you to 33 years. We don't have any prisons, so you can just go and just walk or whatever. That's perfectly fine legally. That's I mean I don't think that's a very good way to run the state or anything. But so then what we do is we have a legislature, and the legislature says, no, we want 99W, or we want I-5, and we need some roads, and we need, so we're going to vote to tax the people and spend that on some roads, and we're going to, we don't want to let people out about the or murderers or anything like that, so we're going to have some prisons or whatever, and some other kinds of things. And so that's that's where the bureaucracy comes from. So it, it starts out with the, the legislature, legislature. Oregon has two legislatures. I don't know if you know that. So we have the one that's in downtown Salem, and I'm a member of that legislature there. I'm a state representative. And so there's 90 people. There's 60 representatives and 30 senators that serve there, and I'm one of them. And so we make a bunch of laws. There's another legislature in the state of Oregon, and that's you, because the people reserve legislative power to themselves. And so that's through the initiative process. And we have some citizens' initiative petitions in the back there, and I'll talk more about those later, that you can sign so you can do that. So I'm a member of both legislatures, and I actively execute my power in both legislatures there. So uh, I, can't get, I can't get things done in one legislature. I go to the other legislature and try to get them done. But if you remember that, that you're, 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 you are a legislator. So this is Harney County Commissioner, former, former Harney County Commissioner, Mark Owens there. The reason I put him up there is because with, um, when we have a vacancy, in a uh, partisan elected office there. We have a procedure to fill that vacancy. And this is a pretty, pretty important procedure that happens, and some of you might know about it, and some of you might have been involved in it. But what we do is when you have a vacancy, so if I were to die, or if I were to be removed from office, or if I were to resign, or uh, uh, whatever, uh, then there'll be a vacancy in my office, and then to replace me, we have a procedure. <laughs> We get the precinct committee people together, PCPs, right? You don't know about that. So how many people are a PCP? Oh, good. Yeah, that, that warms my heart there. And if you're not a PCP, you can uh, talk to your local county party and about becoming a PCP. But this is one of the most important things. So they call a convention of the PCPs, and the PCPs from that district pick three to five nominees to be the next state representative or whatever from House of 23. I'm not giving up my seat yet, but I'm on a vacancy. But there was a vacancy out in Eastern Oregon there in House District 60. So um, Greg Walden, who's the congressman from Congressional District 2, decided that he's not going to run for re-election. One of the people that's running for his seat is State Rep or State Senator Cliff Bentz from Senate District 30 in kind of Northeastern Oregon there. So he vacated his Senate seat. So when he vacated that seat, they had to have a convention of PCPs, and they picked Lynn Finley, who was a state representative, or every Senate district has two representative districts in it there. So uh, they picked Lynn Finley from Senate District 60 to fill that Senate seat there. And they had a vacancy in House District 60, and they picked Harney County Commissioner Mark Owens to, to do that. So the PCPs come up with three to five nomination nominees, and then they present those people to the county commissioners in the counties that do that. Now, uh, one of the things that it's, so it's one person, one vote, but if you're a PCP, that doesn't count as a person. That counts as 
you're just representing the person. So that you, if you're representing 10 people, if I'm representing 10 people and Darlene's representing 100 people, I get one vote and she gets 10 votes, right? So it's one person, one vote, one voter, one vote, I should say, kind of like that. So, um, and then the county commissioners are the same thing. So um, if you have a, a, most of the district is in one county and not the other, uh, that happened. Do you remember State Senator Jackie Winters died last year? When she died, uh, most of her district is in Polk County, it's about two thirds of it is in Polk County, and about one third of her district is in Marion County. So the Polk County commissioners have got, got more votes than the Marion County commissioners uh, when that thing came up. So uh, anyway, so that's the procedure for doing that. And that's a pretty important reason to be a PCP. I don't know if you know this, but more than half of the state representatives and state senators that are, that, that are serving were not elected first, they were appointed first. And so they may have been elected since, but so uh, it's pretty important. This is a pretty important function in how we do our government. So in some counties, the county commissioners are partisan and sometimes they're nonpartisan. I think if they're nonpartisan, then the other county commissioners pick the replacement. If they're partisan, when I mean partisan, we have, <coughs> excuse me, a Democrat and Republican primary, uh, then it goes through this PCP process to replace that. I know in Polk County they're nonpartisan, and I think in Marion County they're also nonpartisan. Right? Does, does anybody know what's different on that? So yeah, so I think so. Anyway, so um, so that's that process there. So uh, legislators, so qualifications um, are pretty slim, pretty easy to fit. You have to be a U.S. citizen. That makes sense. You have to be 21 years old. So. Uh, pretty young like that. Um, but the Constitution says you have to live in the district. And what that means is that you have to be registered to vote with your residence address in the district. And uh, that's kind of all I'll say about that. But there's some people who don't really truly live in the district. So uh, sometimes that happens. But if you can, uh, uh, if you can be registered to vote in the residence address there. You can be a felon, but you have to have served your time. So, uh, um, so um, Anyway, that's it. So uh, working conditions. One, this is one thing that I think is cool about my job uh, is um, I can't be arrested. You can't do a civil pro procedure on me while we're in session. I think it's like 10 days before the session, 10 days after the session. So I can't be arrested during the session. I think that's kind of cool. Don't, don't worry though, after the session, I think if I need to be arrested, I think they know where I'm at. They'll find out. They'll take care of me. But uh, anyway, so the pay is not, not that great there. So I make, I, I just got a raise. The reason I did not vote myself a raise. It didn't come to a, uh, it didn't come to a vote or anything like that. It was because the minimum wage got increased in the Salem area. It was, the minimum wage is different in different areas. And so I, at the time, I would be making less than minimum wage. So my wage had to go up there. And then I get uh, $149 per day there. Um, there's a thing, uh, one other thing they have is they have, it's a call of the house there. So when they do a call of the house, that means that the, and usually most people are pretty cooperative about this, but you have to go and you have to show up on the house floor. If you don't, the state police will come looking for you. And uh, anyway, we do a call of the house every now and then, because sometimes you think some Democrats are trying to sneak out in votes or something like that. So, so um, we do that, but anyway. So that's some of the kind of working conditions that are uh, constitutionally mandated and driven uh, working conditions there. So we do, uh, so we, on a two year cycle, so starting, well, let's just say, let's just start with November. Let's start with November, 2020. So God willing, I'll get elected, reelected in November of 2020, or maybe not. And, uh, and it's a bunch of other, there'll be 60 state representatives somehow get elected in, um, in 2020. They, then in, in January of 2021, we'll start the 2021 session there. That will go for six months or, what does it say, 160 days. So it's not, not quite six months, but uh, it'll go for 160 days. So we'll end right around the 4th of July. So we'll go from kind of end of January to 4th of July there. And so that we call that the long session. It's a six month session. We can extend that. Um, let's, let's, yeah. We can extend that we need, in five day increments. We need like a two thirds vote to do that. And I gotta tell you, by the end, when you get by the end, there's not very much right appetite to extend it. So you better get your work done in <laughs> six months there. So we, um, so uh, anyway, so that's the long session there. So I get elected in November, get sworn in in January, January to July, we serve, and then we go out of session, and then we're out of session, and all the way until the next February, that's what we're coming up on right now, 
this is the kind of second thing. So in 2022 or 2020, in this case, there'll be a short session, which is a month, something like that, 35 days. And uh, and so we we, uh, we do that, and then we're out of session for until the next January there. So that's so uh, every two years, it's on for six months, off, and then on for a month or whatever. So we uh, we work seven months up, and we're, we're off. 17 months in a 24 year, 24 month period there. When I'm off, people people say, well, you're off, you're not doing anything or something like that. And uh, they say, what's your work day like? Or how hard do you work or something like that? That's kind of a hard question. I, I always come back with my answer to that is, well, what do you consider work? So like, uh, am I working right now? Am I working as a state representative? What do you say, yes or no? Yes. And, and I kind of think so, yeah. Oh, well, I like doing this. and. Uh, um, whatever, but I, I probably wouldn't have this audience if I wasn't a state representative. So hey, this is kind of work or whatever. If I'm campaigning, am I working? Yes. Uh, it's a little weaker, but yeah, I'm kind of. I consider it work <laughs> or something, but I don't know. It's not really serving the people or whatever. I guess I'm uh, trading information with people, so uh, it is kind of kind of uh, done that. Um, the, so uh, when so we just created emergency or we created uh, the short session just got created. I want to say like six or eight years ago. So this is only like our third constitutionally mandated short session. I get asked a lot about like, hey, we did, we did the short session, it was only supposed to be about budget fixes and you know tweaking little bills and stuff like that. And so how come we're doing all this big stuff like climate change and uh, banning guns and all this kind of stuff during the short session there? Can we fix that or can we declare those laws unconstitutional or something like that? And the answer is pretty much no. So we can do anything in a short session that we can do in a long session. So um, you can question the appropriateness of it, all that. But there's no constitutional restriction on what we can do during a short session there. We don't usually consider budget items. The state of Oregon runs on a two-year budget, so they call it a biennial budget. And so uh, we, we, in a, the odd number of years, in the long session, we pass a two-year budget for all the agencies. <laughs> So that, that's how it was sold to people. That's how it was sold when it was when it was when, when we had a, we had a ballot measure to enable the short session there. So, but and so, you know, the, yeah, it just it just defines the time of it and how long it can be and everything. So, so there's there's no there's no limits on it. We can pass whatever we want. Um, I mean, whatever's constitutional, or whatever. But there's no um, like only budget fixes or anything like that. So um, Senator Thatcher, Kim Thatcher, who's uh, in Kaiser, Newburgh, up to Wilsonville, um, yeah, she's, she's got a bill that is proposing to, I believe, to eliminate the short session. And so um, I don't expect that that bill will get traction, but I was looking for it, so I want to kind of I want to sign on to that one. I want to co-sponsor that one. So um, I don't, I think what, it, what, in fact, what the short session is, is because it's right before the election, right? So we're going to, so we're gonna have this short session that's go, gonna go from February to March. And then as soon as we get out, that's the end of the filing deadline. And then we, we have a primary in May and a general election in November. So what the short session really is, it's not about budget fixes. It's about making the minority party take hard votes so they can clobber us in the elections there. That's that's kind of not gonna happen. That, or, so now I'm predicting here. Remember, whenever you get predictions from me, you always get your money's worth too. <laughs> but, um, but um, so I, I don't think so. Usually, that's what the short session ends up being for: is the my, the majority party makes the minority party take hard votes so they can clobber them in the next election. There, what's really going to happen now, I think, is that the Democrats are saying, eh, "We got this super majority right now, and we could get a lot of cool stuff done." And we didn't get it all done in the last session. So let's focus on getting all this cool stuff done, like uh, climate legislation and uh, taking away your guns and everything like that. Yeah. And so that's what they're doing right now. They're trying. They're saying, let's get it all done now while we have the supermajority there. Yeah. What else can we be doing? So, I mean, yeah. Just showing up at the Capitol, yeah. walking the halls. Mm -hmm. like. I think so, yeah. And I think uh, um, uh, any kind of pressure you can put on, and there's lots of different kind of pressure. The, the emails are good, the phone calls are good. 
uh, Democrats respond well to riots or things that resemble <laughs> riots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're Republicans. <laughs> um, the, those of us who are good conservatives, let's say that we don't we don't uh, we don't do the riots that well. But uh, but we, we are going to have a timber unity rally, and that's a big deal. Democrats notice that stuff. They notice, uh, you know, I think Democrats don't get out in the rural areas that much. You know, they go to the beach or something like that to get kind of driving through the coast range. But they don't really spend that much time in the rural areas talking to rural people. And so when rural people show up in droves, I think you know, you got to remember, I hear a lot of people say, oh, you know, Portland controls the rest of the state or whatever. But the state of Oregon has about 4 million people just a couple years ago, we went over the 4 million mark there. And then Portland area has about a million of those. So Portland is only about a quarter of the state there. So I don't really buy it that the Portland area controls everything. And when we show up at like a tour unity rally and those kinds of things, that lets Democrats know that there are people elsewhere in the state that care about stuff. So um, anyway, uh, one other thing is, so we have the possibility of having emergency sessions. Uh, so the governor can call us back in the session. They had, um, that's about, Eight or ten years ago, when they had five emergency sessions in one year because the economy tanked, and so they had to go back and cut budgets and everything. So um, we can have emergency sessions for anything. We had one in I think it was 2013 or something like that. There were five bills that went through. They were kind of log rolling bills. There were certain compromises that kind of were linked to each other, and so. Uh, we can call an emergency session. When we call an emergency session, again, we can do whatever we want. We can pass budgets, we can uh, appropriate money, we can change laws, we can do anything that we can do in the regular session. So there's no, no restriction on that. So, um, uh, okay. Um, so coming up, so you know, in the uh, US Constitution, it calls for a census every 10 years. And so, and that happens on years of 10 and zero. So, 2010, 2020. So 2020 will be a census here. So when they do a census, they um, the, the Oregon Constitution says we have to do redistricting uh, during that year. So it won't be for this election. It will first show up in the 2022 election there. But what they require is the state of Oregon, the legislature in the state of Oregon, has to pass a map. So it's not really actually a map, but it's a list of census tracts. But, you, but it's essentially a map of all of the legislative districts and all of the congressional districts. So um, uh, that's one thing that will be coming up in the 2021 session there. We'll have to uh, pass that map there. So, <coughs> excuse me. So that's uh, every 10 years. And so the, the procedure is, is that the, the Oregon Constitution says that the legislature has to pass that map. So possibly we don't pass that map. We don't, I mean, it can't make us pass a map. Maybe we don't agree on it. Or maybe we're just worrying, or maybe we're lazy, or something like that. We just don't pass the map. So if we don't pass the map, or has like what's gone in some sessions is one of the parties will walk out. I think that was the when the, the last time we did that, the Republican or was, uh, the 2000, I think it was. The Republicans were in control of one chamber. The Democrats didn't like the map the Republicans were proposing and had a Democrat Secretary of State, and so they walked out. They left the state to deny a quorum and. Um, so no map got drawn, and if the no map gets drawn by the sec by the legislature, it goes to the Secretary of State. And then once once the map gets drawn by whoever draws it, anybody who's a voter can contest that map, and there's certain criteria that that map has to have. And eventually it's going to go to, to the state Supreme Court, so the Oregon Supreme Court, and they will draw the map. They will draw the final map there. So uh, that's how that process works. <laughs> Yep. So get ready for that. That's going to be a big battle. That was one of the things with um, so Secretary of State Dennis Richardson. Um, so we're hoping to have him in office there, so that uh, um, if we didn't have a legislative majority, we could use the threat of a walkout to at least have some leverage on that map there. So one of the things they like to do is the uh, ordinary and misbehaving legislators and draw them out of their districts there. So I live about 50 yards from the edge of my district, so I'm waiting for that to happen to me. So there's a there's an initial petition to, to do that, yeah. So there was one uh, was being sponsored by Kevin Mannix. I don't think it really got legs. 
um, to have like a, a commission that was appointed by uh, local chunks of county commissioners around the state there. And then the, there's another one that's kind of active right now. Um, I don't think it's, either one of them is going to make it in time to, to impact the process, but there's thoughts of doing that. It, some states do that. They have a redistricting commission that's possibly, you'd say, like appointed by the governor or something like that. But I kind of like the idea of having county commissioners somehow uh, be the major influencers on, on uh, the redistricting. Because county boundaries don't change, not that they've never changed, but, the, but we, don't, we don't redistrict the counties. Marion County is going to be Marion County when all this is done. But House District 23 is going to change because whatever, some people moved in and it lost population or gained population or whatever. So we're going to have to redraw the map and whatever. So it's kind of nice to have, it's, 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 it's a bad thing whenever you have somebody eating their own dog food. It's kind of the point. So I'm a state representative and I'm supposed to have my hands in drawing a map that I'm going to have. That I'm going to run to run under. So that's not really a, a recipe for success there. So, or to have um, the majority party uh, making a district for me that's in the minority party, that's that's not a recipe that's uh, for success there. So, um, so anyway, so that's a portion of there. So, do you see these four people? Do you know? Does anybody know who any of these people are? These four people? They're up here. Well, Jennifer Williamson, yes, yeah, so you know her. She's, she used to be the House Majority Leader, and she just resigned to run for Secretary of State. You got another guest there, right? Mark Koss, Senator Mark Koss, he's resigning to also run for Secretary of State. No, no, no. <laughs> so, uh, so, Tobias Reed, he's not up here. No, we'll have him later. We'll talk about him in a minute. Yeah. So, um, so this is uh, Jamie McLeod Skinner, and she ran against she ran for Congress against Greg Walden in the second congressional district, which is way up all of eastern Oregon, kind of swoops over and gets southern Oregon there. And she is also running for Secretary of State. And this is Cameron Smith, who is the former, he was the head of the Oregon Department of Veteran Affairs, and um, and uh, um, the Department of Consumer Business Services. So he's just resigned from that to run for Secretary of State. He's, he's a former Marine, and when he would testify in front of committees, he would say, you know what Marine stands for? I'm, I'm not a veteran, so, I'm, uh, so I hope nobody's offended by this, but uh, you know, he said, you know what Marine stands for? It stands for muscles are required, intelligence not essential. <laughs> <laughs> That's him talking, not me. So, <laughs> if anybody who's ever served at the Marine Corps in here, thank you. <laughs> anyway, okay, so that the house proceedings there. So we need to, so quorum is a big word. Everybody knows what the word quorum means nowadays, right? And so uh, we need 40 in the house and 20 in the Senate to do business. So we can't do business unless we have uh, 40, and that's on a day-to-day -day basis that they do that. So we we show up for a floor session, and the first thing we do is check in and they say, Do we have 40? A quorum is present, so that's the first thing we do each day there. So we have you've heard of Robert's Rules of Order, right? And so Robert's Rules of Order is a system of parliamentary procedure, parliamentary rules on how to how bodies govern themselves, right? And so it's all the thing of like, well, I I move that we um, adjourn. Well, I second the motion, and you know I object and all that stuff. That all comes from Robert's Rules of Order. Well, uh, uh, General Robert was a general in the Civil War. And so Robert's rules, it was after the Civil War was over that he created that, system, that parliamentary system. But the thing, if you remember, Oregon was a state before the Civil War. So Oregon was a state before Robert's Rules of Order even came into existence there. So we have a thing called Mason's Rules of Order, which is similar to Robert's Rules of Order. And if you watch, we have things like we have motions and those kinds of things. There's thing in Mason's is does not have seconds of motions there, right? So when we're in committee and we say, I move that uh, we send this bill to the House with a due pass recommendation. There's no, I second the motion. We don't do that in the legislature. There are many Mason's rules for it there. So, um, in the Oregon Constitution says that each bill has to be read in its entirety unless two thirds of the uh, chamber agrees to not read it in its entirety there. And so, that's one thing that the minority party, if we have a third, which we do, that we can use as a little bit of a, of a, 
club over the majority's head is to force them to read all the bills there. So, and that's actually what that picture of was of me. We were forcing them to read every word of every bill. Uh, after a while, we were doing that. And this was this was some bill on marijuana. And so that so as punishment, the speaker said, okay, you Republicans, you want to read every word of every bill? And you and Aaron get up here and start reading. <laughs> so anyway, so that was, that was me, that was me in the timeout chamber here. So, uh, there was a bill on, I remember it was a bill on marijuana. I was going to vote no on it. And but that, the, my biggest problem that day was it had super long, hard words in it. Like, these are not eighth grade words. And so, <laughs> yeah, so it's, um, I think I still have two marks in my time. <laughs> so yeah, there's some special supermajorities that exist here and there. We have um, uh, we have a three-fifths vote is required to raise taxes. So um, they monkey with that because they say, well, what if we do this? What if we end a tax credit and then that gets put some money back in and then we start a new tax over here? And so those are uh, revenue neutral, and so we didn't raise taxes, so we need a three-fifths majority. That hasn't been litigated, and so um, we're, we, that's always a little uh, chess game and political football that we uh, play with them. So. Are there any questions, or we'll take a little break second here, then does anybody have any questions, or anything, yeah? So, we can add an emergency clause. No? Okay. Yeah. Okay. How did the Student Success Act pass if it takes a three-month vote required to raise taxes? So that's a, that's a good question. So how did the Student Success Act pass if it takes a two-thirds requirement to, to do that? It's a three-fifths requirement, right? Yeah. It's to raise taxes. And right now the Democrats have three-fifths. So they uh, they have a three-fifths majority there, which would be 36, right? That's a little calculator. I do it now. So I, I believe that, so they, they, have a, they have a tax raising supermajority right now. And so they can just raise taxes. So that's that's this is this is what I think is um, this gives us a little bit of a political opportunity, right? So for a long time, and now I'm just going to give a little bit of opinion here on what I think the Student Success Act did and how we can work with that. But for a long time, the uh, teaching the uh, education industrial complex, whatever, has been saying we need more money. We need more money. We said we're not happy with the results of our K through 12 education. I know, we need more money, we need more money. That was been the refrain from the beginning. So finally, finally they get a hold of the checkbook and they can write themselves as big of a check as they want. So they wrote themselves a check for $2 billion. I mean, that's, that's not the entire budget, that's just the increase in the in the education budget. Just to give you an idea of how much money that is. Because I've never had a billion dollars. I never even had a million dollars. So I just like those kind of numbers just kind of just you just go wow and you just kind of gawk at it. But to give you an idea of how big two billion dollars is, is the entire discretionary budget of the state of Oregon is about twenty-five billion dollars there. So that's so that's like so that, remember that so and the education budget is just about eight billion dollars on that, the K through twelve education budget. So to add two billion to that is huge. So they say, oh we uh, kids, we're not happy with the outcomes of K through twelve education. We need more money. We, um, we don't have that much money, whatever. We need more money. We need more money. So finally, they get a hold of the checkbook and they write themselves a check for as big as they want. They create a whole new tax, everything. They did that. I think a few years from now, I think uh, four years from now, two years from now, or something. I think that educational outcomes. Let's so make a prediction here. Remember, when you get predictions from me, you always get your money's worth. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm going to predict that the educational outcomes won't be that much better, if at all. And then I, what I think fits nicely in the bumper sticker is we want our money back yeah. because we, we didn't get that. But anyway, so that's just my little commentary on the student success act. So I'm going to get back to the um, what else? Okay, so you brought up the emergency clause. So in Oregon, you see there's a thing. It's, <laughs> I forget how it's exactly worded. It says, to preserve the peace, health, and safety of Oregonians. An emergency is declared. So they put that in the bill. It's almost always the last section of the bill. So if the bill has eight sections, they'll put a ninth section on there that says the peace, health, and to preserve the peace, health, and safety of Oregonians, an emergency is declared there. And when they do that, that kicks in a couple of things. So first of all, a bill that has an emergency, you can't, these are just quotes from the, uh, from the Constitution there. When a, when a bill declares an emergency, 
you can't do a referendum on that. So re what a referendum is, is the people of the state of Oregon have reserved to themselves the right to veto any act of the legislature. That's what referendum is. And we've done referendums before. Does anybody know that you remember the last time we did a successful referendum in the state of Oregon where the legislature passed an act and the people of the state of Oregon vetoed it? Was it what? Yeah, you're right, yeah, exactly. It was uh, Measure 88 in 2014. Was the uh, the uh, they passed uh, Senate Bill 833, which uh, allowed the, the DMV to issue driver cards to illegal aliens. And uh, Measure 88, we went down and got clipboards out, and we put that on the ballot. And the people of the state of Oregon uh, voted to to repeal that act of the legislature. Um, so to the people? No, it, so uh, no, it went once to the vote of the people. And now the legislature has now said that that uh, illegal aliens can get driver's licenses now. So when we told them no, they said, well, we don't care what you say. But we can do that. We have two legislatures, and the, the legislature one can say the speed limit on I-5 is 90. And then the next legislature can say, no, the speed limit on I-5 is 65. And then the next legislature can come along and say, no, it's not. It's 90. And we can do that. And so that's what's going on there. With that, is we told them that, and they said no. So, yeah. Go ahead. Who monitors the yes and the no's on emergency clause and getting that into bills? Because this last session, what percentage had emergency clauses? <laughs> Over 3,000 bills that were going through? Yeah, it's, it's quite a few. So, um, Are there stipulations on what? Allow emergency clause, or can they do no, no. So my favorite example of one is they had a bill, and I believe this they, they've had this bill in several uh, legislative sessions. But in Washington D.C., there's a statuary hall, and, they, and every state is allowed to put two statues there. And so we have John McLaughlin and Jason Lee there, right? And so there's a bill to take out the statue of Jason Lee and put a statue of Mark Hatfield in there, right? So now, forget however you feel about that, or if you like Mark Hatfield, or if you like Jason Lee, or whatever, so just forget that. That bill had an emergency clause, because that bill was necessary to preserve the peace, health, and safety of Oregonians, right? <laughs> so anyway, so they can put an emergency clause on any bill there. When you say, who controls that? It's the author of the bill, so it's me. So I'll tell you about an interesting story that I have with, so let's say councils, the, the lawyers that write up the bills. So I don't actually sit and write a bill. I'm not a lawyer or anything like that. I'm not, contrary to what you might think, I'm not really truly an expert on the working constitution or law or anything like that. But anyway, so, but, uh, um, the, let, so we give our ideas to legislative counsel. So I'll say something to them like, hey, can we make the speed limit 90 on I-5, right? And they say, okay, and they know where to put it in what section. And they say, well, if you do this, you're going to have to repeal this. And if you do this, you're also going to have to have some spending. So they know how to make it into a law. And so we give them our ideas, and they make it into laws or whatever, something like that. And so many, many years ago, when I first started in the legislature, they put an emergency clause on literally almost every bill. And I remember having a conversation with one of the lawyers there, and I said, you know, I gave her my idea, and she wrote it up into a bill. And I said, okay, that's good, except can you take the emergency clause off the end of it there? And she says, well, Representative Newman, that's not how we do things here. And I said, well, maybe you could put a little clause after the emergency clause there that says, notwithstanding the Oregon Constitution, the people retain their right to do a referendum on this bill. And she said, you can't, you can't do that. You can't do notwithstanding, you can't use a law to wipe out part of the Constitution. She says, you can't do notwithstanding the Constitution. I said, right. <laughs> so I said, take the emergency clause off the bill. So she, she wouldn't do it. So I had to go to her boss, who's the chief uh, uh, let's say council there and say, I want this bill and I don't want the emergency clause on it, so take it off. So they took it off because I run the joint, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, so the, on, on that note, too, is uh, I think I said this last time, too. If you have a bill that they believe is unconstitutional and the, the end arbiter of whether or not a bill is unconstitutional is the Oregon Supreme Court, but if you have a bill that's unconstitutional, They'll let you write a bill that's unconstitutional. So, well, no, I mean, I, I, I've, had a, I've had a bill that they've had judged to be unconstitutional. It's to do an educational voucher system. 
because of the Blaine Amendment in the Oregon Constitution. So they'll write the bill for you to say, blah, 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 here's a voucher system there. And then they'll, send, they'll give you the bill, and then they'll give you an opinion saying, by the way, we think this bill would be unconstitutional here. But that's just their opinion. And we can pass whatever we want that's, that may be unconstitutional. I believe that the, that the federal courts would, would strike down the Oregon Constitution in that. So I, I don't think it's unconstitutional there. But anyway, they'll write a bill that, that they believe is unconstitutional for them. So anyway, and then uh, on the end there, so the people of Oregon have a line item veto. And um, uh, not in the federal government, so the president does not have a line item veto. Donald Trump either signs legislation or he vetoes it. That's his only options there. In the state of Oregon, the governor has a line item veto. And so Kate Brown can take a budget bill there and can say, oh, there's these 10 items except number two and number eight. We're not going to do those. So just run a line through those and sign the bill, and, and uh, that becomes law. So um, uh, there, was one, uh, there was one case where uh, Sal Escobel, Superintendent Sal Escobel in Medford, um, this, was, this had to do with, uh, remember there was the uh, some healthcare tax. Um, this was like four years ago or something like that. So he um, he gave the governor his vote on the healthcare tax, and then he put up uh, an initiative petition, a referendum petition, to repeal that healthcare tax. So uh, so he was giving his vote to the governor for some reason or whatever, and then he put got involved with the initiative to repeal that. And she wasn't all that happy about that, and so she line item out some of the stuff that he had negotiated for for that vote there. So uh, anyway. Uh, that kind of stuff goes on. <laughs> so, okay, and then um, so just uh, some just just some weird stuff about in the Constitution. So this, uh, on the legislature here. So um, this is my favorite part of the Constitution. My absolute hundred percent favorite part here. And I'm not going to leave the face of planet Earth until someday I litigate this. I'm going to go sue somebody based on this. Every act and joint resolution shall be plainly worded, avoiding as far as practical. These are technical terms, right? So I'm gonna someday they're gonna write a law, we're gonna pass a law, whatever, and say so I don't need that law, and I don't understand that law. And I'm gonna say, and I'm, and I'm not an idiot, so I'm suing because that thing wasn't wasn't understandable. So um, anyway, so that's that's kind of a cool thing. So anybody, if you ever come up with a law that you don't like, let's not word it all that clearly. Let's talk about uh, some litigation on that. <laughs> and then so this is kind of cool here is uh um that the, the House of Representatives can put me in prison. So, and that doesn't, I, you don't have to go before a judge or anything like that. They can just put me in prison. So the Democrats can say, Aaron, shut up, we're sick of you. <laughs> and they can put me in prison, but, it, but not for a period longer than 24 hours there. So, it's not, it's not kind of cool there. It's like the time, it's like they invented timeout before timeout was cool. <laughs> John. Any. Oh, maybe. Oh. oh, so yeah, so I'm off the hook there. But they can have <laughs> not, yeah. not no, right, you're not off the hook, yeah. So we can put Tina in prison for 24 hours. <laughs> what? Yeah. Um, and then, uh, so one other thing too, not every act of the legislature requires the signature of the governor. So if you notice, there are some things that are like uh, um, HB 2020, right? And then some of them are weird. They're like HJR 2020 or something, or, 20, or something like that, right? HJR 15 or something like that. They have different things. So those are, that's like a House joint resolution or something like that. So we do things like, for instance, we'll pass, uh, like it's not a bill, but we'll pass an act um, honoring the women's volleyball team from West Florida University because they won the championship. Or there's things like, for instance, um, where the United States Constitution will say um, that uh, like, if to amend the United States Constitution has to be approved by three quarters of the state legislatures, right? And so for that, we don't need the signature of the governor there. We can approve amendments to the Constitution just by passing that. So those are not bills. So that's not like HB 2020, that'd be like HJR 13 or something like that. And so we don't get the signature of the governor on those. Um, so there's uh, some of those. Um, 
And then, uh, oh, there's also a two thirds vote required to reduce criminal, criminal sentences by initiative. That, or that got put in with, to the Constitution by initiative. That was part of the Measure 11 movement there. And so um, we had, we changed some criminal sentencing things uh, in the last session there, and we had to have a two thirds vote. So uh, um, we ran into that. So, any questions on, on this stuff here? So that's some, some cool things about, about the Constitution. Oops. Okay, so now that so like, I knew I was putting that picture in there, I thought, man, when I put that picture up there, people are going to <laughs> Anyway, okay, so uh, we have the, uh, the the governor, the executive branch, and the governor there. So the, the governor's term limited to eight years. Oregon has kind of a weird term limit thing. You're limited to eight years, and then you have to sit out four years, and then you can come back, right? So has any governor ever done that? Run and then served eight years and then stopped and come back to the know governor in Oregon that's done that? Yeah, John Kitzhaber did that. And he almost went for 16 years because he got elected to two terms, sat out, and Kulingoski was in for eight, eight years. He could have ran against Kulingoski and primary him, but he didn't. And then after Kulingoski, Kitzhaber came back on a third term and was actually elected to a fourth term. And that was the same election that I was in, and it was very early in my political career that he um, resigned in disgrace, whatever, something like that. So he, he did that. Um, so there's the line of succession for the, uh, the governor there. So that's how Kate Brown got to be governor in the first place, was she uh, was secretary of state. And so uh, Kids Harbor resigned, that created a vacancy, the procedure for vacancy there. And there's the succession on that. And then uh, we talked about this too, that the governor can call a special session. So uh, that's the governor there. So uh, if you ever, do you, you guys know what that building is? It's like between court and state streets and uh, cottage or something like that, right? In downtown Salem. It's like the creepiest Stalinist building. I mean, they're all creepy <laughs> Stalinist buildings, but that's like the creepiest, the Stalinist is of the buildings there. But anyway, that's the executive office building there. So um, it was years and years and years. I had never, ever been in that building. Finally, I went to a meeting in that building there. That's not that creepy inside, but well, it's just like, I don't know, I need some kind of spray to go in there or something like that. <laughs> uh, anyway, so um, um, so the, the, the governor, who talked about this, has a, has a line item veto, um, and uh, 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 line item, any provision in a bill that's declared an emergency. Um, we have uh, the uh, State of the state address there, just like the state of the union address, so that's called out there. And um, uh, uh, he and the Oregon Constitution refers to governor as he, whatever, I think that's just a little archaic, but the governor shall transact all necessary business with uh, officers of the government. So that's the agencies of the government. So Kate Brown has uh, dominion over all the agencies of the government. That's the Department of Fish and Wildlife, the DEQ, the uh, ODOT, uh, the Department of Consumer Business Services, one of the largest agencies in the state of Oregon is the, it's the, it's, no, it's, we call it Business Oregon, but it's the, um, yeah, Department of Administrative Services, but that's what it's, Business Oregon is the Economic Development Agency of the state of Oregon, which has gobs and gobs of money going through it there. So um, anyway, so the, and the governor is in charge of all of that. The governor appoints all the, com the commissioners. So when you say like the Transportation Commission, that has several people on it, like nine people on it or whatever, the governor appoints all those. The Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission, the governor appoints all of those. The, um, uh, the, there's a, a initiative petition back there to influence the appointing uh, of the uh, um, uh, Environmental Commission, whatever, so of the D that, that's the DEQ. So there's, the Oregon has a super powerful Governor there that controls all, all of that stuff. Yeah. So when the when the governor changes, say you got to become voters and you fire all them, like President Trump did with his, will you have the ability to remove ODFW heads and all that? So yes, yes they do. So that, that's a good question. So um and uh, and uh, so the last time that, that so we haven't we haven't had a changeover in the party of the governor since Nicotia, like he left office in 1978 or something like that. So it's been super long time since we've had a change in, in that. We did have a change in the party that was controlling one of the executive branch agencies, which was the Secretary of State. 
which the Secretary of State is kind of its own entity there. They have their own elected head there. So they're part of the executive branch, but like for instance, when we do budget things, and so let's just say the, uh, the employment department will come and ask during their budget hearings, during a normal cycle, and they just need a budget order. And they'll say, blah, 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 we need this kind of amount of money or something like that. At the end of their budget hearings, then a person from the uh, governor's office will come up and say, we recommend that you uh, accept this budget or whatever. And then our legislative fiscal officer will say, we also recommend that you accept this budget there. And then I vote no on it anyway. But, uh, but uh, when the Secretary of State's budget comes up, the governor does not come up and recommend passage of the Secretary of State's budget because that's a separate elected official there. So um, uh, anyway, when 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 the when the Secretary of State changed hands there, so when it was uh, um, it was uh, I forget her name. That was the Secretary of State before Dennis Richardson, whatever. Um, then uh, he kept Dennis Richardson kept many of the of the people that were in there. Ironically. Bev Clarno, who took over after Dennis Richardson died, Bev Clarno cleaned house. And so she uh, fired quite a few people that were uh, kind of higher ups in the Secretary of State's office. So it's legal and possible and all that kind of stuff. We have, still have civil service protection, so you can't do the Andrew Jackson thing, like fire everybody down to the guy at the counter of the DMV and just clear it out and put all your nephews in the <laughs> so so we, you can't do that, but certainly the agency heads and the higher ups in the agency can do that. And so, mm. so the sheriffs are different though. So Oregon State Police is a state agency, that's our state police there, but every county has sheriffs then, right? So the Polk, Polk County or Marion County has its own sheriff and we elect our own County sheriffs there, so that's a different thing. So, and and they're not in the same food chain there. So the state police might do one thing and might behave one way, and the Marion County sheriff might behave a different way. So, so if we have a state police, so if we have a state law, yes, the state police can come in and enforce that, and the sheriff may say, no, I'm not going to enforce that, I'm not going to support that. So you could have a difference on those kinds of things like that. So they both have jurisdiction because right now I'm standing in the state of Oregon. I'm also standing in Marion County. I'm also standing in the city of Salem. I'm pretty sure I need to. And so, um, uh, so, so have multiple overlapping jurisdictions. And so but that's a good question. So if one of those jurisdictions should decide that they want to take my guns, then they can come and take my guns. And we'll, then we'll see what happens after that. So, yeah, maybe. No, there's, they don't you know. They, they, so I think for the most part, on a practical level, they cooperate with each other because there's not. They, they just want to stop crime, and there's not that much controversy about that. But um, so uh, as far as authority goes, so um, the city police are responsive to city government, and so they're so the chief of police of the city of Salem or Portland or whatever, Eugene, whatever, they're responsive to this actual city. There, they're a hired person. The sheriff's not a hired person, he's an elected official. And then the state police are responsive to the governor there. So, um, but I think, in, in, so in in kind of a theoretical terms, they're not responsive to each other. There's no chain like, well, the state police get to say so, and then the sheriff, and then the, the city cops. That's not, that's not true. They all have their own jurisdiction. They all can, so they all could come in here and they could arrest me or choose to not arrest me for different things or, or behave differently or whatever or something. But, but in, in practice, they're almost always going to be, uh, they're supportive of each other. And so, like for instance, uh, a few years ago, we had uh, kind of a thing where uh, Polk County had no sheriff's deputies on duty for uh, over 10 hours a day. We called 911, ah, I have this crime being committed right now. And 911 would say, sorry, we have no one to send in Polk County, in rural Polk County. So, uh, which is kind of a crisis. So the state police jumped in and helped out. And was grateful for that. But, uh, but anyway, so um, uh, anyway, but that's on the jurisdiction there. So, but, so here we go. So here's the controversy, and this kind of hurts my brain a lot to talk about this. So I have the three branches of government that we all know and love, and we watch Schoolhouse Rock, and we're, we're paying attention in 10th grade civics. So legislative, executive, judicial. So then the Oregon Constitution talks about a fourth branch of government 
called the administrative, which I believe it says is under the executive or something. So, but uh, but it refers to it as the fourth branch of government. And then it, and then we act. We like I said, when we do budget things, the executive branch doesn't uh, do things. We have things, for instance, we have um, uh, the legislature will put like uh, for information security, we'll put requirements on the executive branch that they behave certain ways with data and stuff like that. The, uh, the Secretary of State says, no, we're not going to take your direction on that. We're going to do our own thing. And the legislature backed off. It's, it's a little bit of a, of a buddy heads of separation of powers. But the Secretary, so we had a thing where he said, um, all the information security professionals that are working at the uh, at agencies, so if you're like the information security guy at Fish and Wildlife, they said, you now report to the head of the chief information security guy at the Department of Administrative Services to the that. And so they took all those information security people from every agency in the state and said, you don't report up through your agency, you report back to the state CIO. We wrote we changed the law to do that to kind of consolidate information security. And the Secretary of State said, thank you very much, we're not going to participate in that. And uh, and it didn't come to fisticuffs, so uh, we just let them let them go with that. So they act as if they're their own branch of government in some ways. There, and I'm kind of okay with that. That's okay. And then the treasurer kind of does that a little bit too. The attorney general is another one, and that one's even weirder because the attorney general is in the constitution is supposed to be responsible to the governor. The, the, the attorney general is the is the is the lawyer for the state of Oregon and reports to the to the. Um, executive branch there, but she's a, a independent elected official, and so um, so it's kind of a, it's a little bit uh, a little bit weird there the way that that works there. So, um, anyway, so how many branches of government do we have in Oregon? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I would give it to say maybe like four. It's kind of a middle number there, but uh, we have at least three, and uh, and arguments can be made that there's more there. Um, <laughs> okay. So the Secretary of State. So that's Bev Carnell on the left there. She's our current Secretary of State. I think she's doing a great job. Um, and uh, I had my doubts when she was first appointed, but I'm very happy with her performance there. Does anybody know who that is? That's shaking her hand right there. Yeah, that's, that's the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. That's Martha Walters there. So, and uh, I don't think she's doing that great job. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so the Secretary of State is a recorder of uh, official acts of the legislature. And so a bill doesn't become a law. The last step in a bill becoming a law is that it gets recorded by the Secretary of State there. And so they uh, do that. They have an auditor of public accounts there, and they do a really good job on that. Even going back to Kate Brown's administration, of the, when Kate Brown was Secretary of State, they did a good job back then. They, um, they did an even better job under Dennis Richardson, and they're continuing to do a good job. And I collect those audits, and I read them, and there's all sorts of really good stuff in there. So I'll speak. So in the legislature, there's two kinds of committees, right? There's actually more than that, but there are really two. I'll just believe that there's two, and you'll be fine. Is there's policy committees and there's ways and means committees. And ways and means committees, they call those budget committees. But we don't really go over budgets because when you do a budget, you have to kind of do the whole thing. And I don't really have the visibility to the whole thing. So that's the co-chairs that do that. But what the ways and means committees are is it's a report card for agencies. Is it's an accountability session for agencies every two years. The Department of Consumer and Business Services has to sit in front of me on the Ways and Means Committee, and I get to say, come on, tell me how you're doing here. And they always say, oh, we're the Department of Consumer and Business Services. We have 65 slides here, and you know what? Everybody loves us, and our employees love to work for us, and we're doing great work. And if you give us more money, we would do even better work. Any questions? And that's every single agency does that exact same thing. And so it's hard to get good information. And so the uh, Secretary of State audits are a great way to kind of peel back the onion and say, oh, you're doing great work. Well, the Secretary of State didn't really think so. And so then you go through on that. So, that. so it's hard to get a good insider information like that. And every now and then I get like a mole that works at an agency or something like that. Like I have a secret mole that works at the Department of Education. And uh, gosh, I get great information from him. And uh, I don't I don't tell anybody where I got it from, but I he's in the committee. So. And so I'm on the education committee, <laughs> the education ways and means subcommittee. Um, so the Secretary of State does elections, and uh, so they uh, those are statewide elections. So if you run for a state office, so even if you're running for a state representative, you go through the, uh, the Secretary of State. 
if you're in for county commissioner or school board or something like that, you're gonna go through the county clerk, whatever. They run the initiative process, so they're the ones that validate the signatures and say whether you got it, whatever, something like that. They do the business registry, registry uh, which is if you're a business in the state of Oregon, you have to register for them, they have a whole division for that. And then they're the plan B for redistricting, right? So remember redistricting, the legislature passes a map. And if we can't pass a map and agree on that, um, then the Secretary of State gets to do it. And uh, so that's pretty important for that office there. <coughs> so the treasurer is um, Tobias Reed, former state representative Tobias Reed from Beaverton. And I served on the Transportation Ways and Means Subcommittee, Transportation Economic Development with him. Um, he's now the treasurer. Oregon has over $100 billion in assets. We just went over $100 billion. That's how, how much money we have in the bank, right? So that's everything. So we have things like, keep hearing about unfunded PERS liability. And right now, PERS has about $60 billion. So like, if you were like really smart and really evil, you could go steal from PERS. There's not, there's not a deficit in PERS right now. Now the future of when people start retiring, then we don't have enough money coming in. And so that's the unfunded liabilities. Right now, per, about 60 billion of that is PERS right now. So we have that. We have like the Highway Trust Fund is in there. We have all sorts of things. The taxes that we, income taxes that we get over time, everything. You're trying to ask a question, right? Yeah, sorry. That's like real money. True, real money. Yeah. True, real money. Yep. What about like the land, the forest land? Mm -hmm. the state so that's not true real money. So we could go get a value on that, and that would stir up a lot of contention. And maybe we would want to do that, but uh, but but I, but um, that's not included in that hundred billion dollars. That's just cash money. And one of the things that state that's cool about having that much cash money, so the treasurer gets to invest that. And if you have a hundred billion dollars, people like they pay attention and they give you good interest rates and all that kind of stuff, you know. If you're near them and you want to invest $65 or something like that, they're like, yeah, okay, money. So, Sam. So if, if, if you have $60, but you know that in the future, you have $60 billion, if you have $60, and you've got twenty dollars that you can see coming in, but you're going to owe a hundred dollars. You have a deficit, right? You have, you have an unfunded actuarial liability, right? That's that's PERS in a nutshell. There, that's how that works. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They have to pay a portion. Yeah. Right. So so the new hires don't get as good a deal as the PERS tier one people since 1993. But those people have to. We have we owe them a lot. A lot of money and a lot of health care and everything so for the future so we're, we're not even to the point where, where we started where that's going to start to bend down yet we're almost to that point but not quite and so we've got a lot of paying out to do for those people to, to get that through the system once they're all gone then we have a little bit smoother sailing but you're right we did kind of fix the, the thing so um, uh, we, we talk about that sometimes when we create rules like that we sometimes create problems because we say but there's things like um, um, we, we want to be we want a good recruiting pool and if we by statute exclude people from working then we exclude that recruiting pool if you retire and we hire you back one of the cool things about that is you're already retired and so we're not going to even have a conversation about pension for you. So we don't pay any pension when we hire those people back. So there's some kinds of things like that that make sense on that. But I get it that, uh, that there's sometimes it, it doesn't make sense. But um, uh, yeah, so Jack, did you have a question? Yeah, you're saying that one billion in assets. That needs to be changed. Yeah, right. That's what you mean. Cash assets, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. like Tina's saying, we got forests and they're, they're pretty. Pretty uh, um, settable. So, okay, I put in a thing here. So, Oregon Constitution talks about counties, and so when, when the Oregon Constitution was written, counties were kind of um, administrative districts of the state. So, no matter where you are in Oregon, you're in a county somewhere. No matter where you are in Oregon, you're also in a school district somewhere. So, every square inch of Oregon is in some county and in some school district, and that's it. You can be in Oregon and not be in a city, but you can't be in Oregon and not be in a county. So, we have these counties as administrative districts. 
And so, and the state treats them like that in a lot of ways. So all, almost all mental health dollars are funded by the state and get given to the counties and it's passed through money. So the counties spend that money and, and provide mental health services. So we treat the counties as kind of administrative <coughs> districts on that. Well, there's one thing in the Oregon Constitution that says that the state can't put an unfunded mandate on a county there. And Lynn County just won a uh, lawsuit. Uh, no, they, no, that was a different lawsuit that they, that they won. But they have a pending lawsuit right now to, that's saying you're, that you're putting unfunded liabilities on us. Um, I think it was for the, uh, um, the uh, Family Medical Leave Act there. So they, that you're putting an unfunded mandate on, on Lynn County there. So Lynn County is pretty aggressive in suing the state of Oregon there. So I am the state of Oregon. I'm pretty excited to be sued on this one. I hope I lose. And um, so uh, anyway, because I think that there are things when the state does that, just puts unfunded mandate on a, on a county here. So, uh, so um, anyway, that happens. But when, uh, so um, I'll talk about it in a minute here. So uh, it talks, it has, so county commissioners, it talks about what their terms are. This is all set up in the Oregon Constitution. And um, uh, the clerk and the treasurer and the sheriff, a coroner, county coroner is mentioned in the Oregon Constitution there. So they have set up all this uh, counties there. So that's kind of the attitude that the Oregon Constitution has towards counties, or at least had towards counties when the Constitution was first passed. But then some people said, hey, you know, we don't like this. So we're like, we're in some county or something like that. And we um, we decided we want to have, uh, we want to have county home rule. And so what county home rule is, is that's when a county can write its own charter. And what a charter is, is a constitution. It's like a little mini constitution for the county there. And so that, that changed, it kind of changed the thing to say, we're not an administrative district of the state. We're our own uh, entity and we have our own, we can make our own laws and we have our own purpose for existence. And so um, I think this is a, some people that are uh, excited about the second amendment stuff. I think this is a, a good opportunity to do that. If, I don't know if you guys know Rob Taylor, he lives in Coos Bay, but he's part of that Second Amendment Sanctuary Ordinance movement there. And so he knows about this home rule county thing. And so he can write an ordinance for home rule county and for a non home rule county. So you see the list of so this list over here, Lane, Washington, Hoover, those are the home rule counties in the state of Oregon. So not Marion, not Polk counties there. All right, maybe we should do something about that in the back there. After. No, so that's the oops, the county clerk is is an elected official. So and yes, they do manage elections, and so some of the elections, so not for state representative or state senator, but they manage their their own election and they manage um, the uh, school board elections and uh, whatever. Sometimes school boards will cross county lines, though, right? So if you have, it's like Salem Kaiser School District is part in Marion County and part in Polk County. Sometimes cities will cross county lines, right? The city of Salem is part in Marion County and part in Polk County, right? And so when we have, when they have elections, they have to, like when they elect the mayor of Salem, part of the returns come from the Polk County clerk and part of the returns come from Marion County clerk. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. You, you live in Marion County, right? Yes, Why don't you run for clerk? Okay, good. <laughs> 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 So, well, um, yeah, I think so. Um, I think, so part of that, part of that changed. So, um, you remember back when you used to sign ballot measures, initiative petitions, and you had to have one sheet for each county. They say, oh, and people still ask me that. They say, I said, hey, do you want to sign this initiative petition? I said, yeah, I live in Guberville County or whatever. I said, oh, no, it doesn't matter what county you live in or statewide. That was a software change. So, so right now, the software centrally manages. Manage. They have a thing called Oregon Centralized Voter Registration System. It's managed by the Secretary of State. 
The county clerks have a terminal input to that. And so when you go register to vote, your voter registration goes to the county clerk there. So voter registration is really managed centrally by the Secretary of State. Voter uh, elections are managed either by the Secretary of State or by the county clerk, depending on, on what election it is. But the ballots always go back, you know, if you look at the address on your ballot when you get that, it goes to the county clerk. So. No, because I think they, they centralized all that. So, yeah, so uh, anyway, yeah. so um, I think that um, there's there's some federal laws that govern that now. So there's the Help Americans Vote Act, and uh, there's another one. But that, so some of that stuff is now micromanaged federally too about what to do on some of that. When we get when we go and we request information on voters from the Secretary of State, they say, "Is this a HAVA record?" And I don't know what that means, but uh, um, and HAVA is Help Americans Vote Act. But they put an indicator on there, or so I think that's some kind of federal meddling in managing that list there. So. Uh, even more meddling in, in that. So uh, I think the, on that, the more meddling, the better, because that means for a cleaner list there or something like that. I suppose some completely evil person could get in there and meddle the wrong direction or whatever. So anyway, so uh, so that's so we have the possibility of home, home rule in the county, and you can just put that on the ballot, and you can vote your county in to be a home rule county. And if you do, then you can have a commission to set up a charter and then you can uh, uh, have some have more power than a regular uh, state rule. Sure. James. So, you know, home rule, does that give sometimes to the ability for the government to create its own taxes and take it away from the voters? So, the government already has the ability to create its own taxes there. So, a county can put on, put taxes on there. And uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is that the state would not allow. So, can a home rule be written in a way and then changed incrementally? That they can take money from you. I, so I, I don't think I don't think it gives I don't think it gives counties any more taxing authority. So I think if you're worried about that as like, well, we don't want to be a home rule county because that's going to mean more taxes or whatever. I don't think that's really a fear because I think counties kind of have plenary ability to raise taxes subject to the limits of Measure Five. So we have caps on property taxes, but you have that cap whether you're home rule county or non home rule county. So I think that's Yep. So and they can they can do that with either county. Yeah. So yeah, with either either kind of kind of county there. So uh, yep. So I don't think you, you um, get, I don't think you save yourself by not doing that. All right. I think what are the dates? Oh, that was the year that they became a home rule county there. So apparently it passed in 1962 or right around there because then the first few counties got on. Lane County is kind of a big innovator. So they're the kind of people that just say, hey, we want home rule county, and then they're like the first to do it kind of stuff. So Lane County is kind of a political, you know how Oregon's all proud, oh, we're the first bottle bill and the first, you know, public beaches and all this kind of stuff. Lane County is like the county that's kind of like a troublesome child like that. So politically <laughs> troublesome. I, I like Lane County. My district goes all the way down to Lane County, so I, I play in Lane County politics a lot, so, which I love to do. Those are good for winners. Not all of them. <laughs> <laughs> all right, is it, so that's the end of my slide presentation. Uh, so I have, um, so I'll, I'll make the invite here. Uh, so anybody can, uh, if anybody has an organization that they're a member of that they would like to do a little advertisement for or an event coming up. Um, you can come up here and I'll let you do that. I'm going to do an advertisement for my own stuff there. At the back table back there, I have, hey, Sue, can you hold up that one of those green signs there? Just hold up one of those green signs. I have any more of those? So I have these to give out here. Those were printed up, I believe, by the Multnomah County Republican Party there. And they're trying to get as many people to stick those in their cars and buses and windows or whatever, or something like that. And it's uh, no carbon tax, uh, carbon tax causes poverty kind of thing. So that's one of the things that, that they're uh, wanting to do. So I have those. For free there. If I run out of those, um, I have more in my car, but you gotta follow me out, you gotta stalk me out. Of the way um, there are four initiative petitions, the same ones we had last time here, but if you didn't get a chance to sign it last time, you wanna sign it this time. So I, IP 10 for this year is the um, is the uh, vote on tolls there. So that says that the government can't toll a road that we've already paid for unless they get a vote of the people in the state of Oregon and a majority vote in the county in which the toll is being imposed. 
The IP2 is judicial vacancy reform. Right now, if a judicial seat goes vacant, then um, uh, uh, the governor appoints that, and this would say, no, it goes to the voters. So at least we get one chance, one chance to vote for judge, which we never did. IP3 is uh, environmental quality commission reform. And I talked about the agencies, and they have a, the larger agencies have a commission that's appointed by the governor, and sometimes they have some regional or professional criteria for the people there. The Environmental Quality Commission oversees the Department of Environmental Quality, and there's no criteria for those. So there's five members on that commission. The governor appoints all five, and we get a governor like Kate Brown. Who, does anybody know what Kate Brown did before she got into politics? She's an environmental lawyer. And um, so uh, anyway, so she appoints all of her uh, spotted owl friends on that commission there, and this says we have some uh, one from ag, one from timber, one from mining, one from manufacturing, and no two from the same congressional district. Uh, that's uh, IP3. IP4 is administrative rule reform. And what that says is that when these agencies, so agencies can pass administrative rules. We didn't talk about this in here, but administrative rules is when the agency just says, like, so we don't pass every single rule in the legislature. Like, how many spike deer tags are they going to give out in the Sumter region in the year 2021? I don't know. I don't don't ask me on that because I'm not an expert on that. Although I do go hunting. So, but um, but, but they, they need biologists and experts to do that. So that's passed by administrative rule. There. How do they pass an administrative rule? The agency thinks up the rule, and then they have hearings. And then you guys possibly show up for the hearings if you find out about it, and they listen to you, and then they do whatever they intended to do in the first place there. And uh, so that there's, uh, there's, so there's, and you can have input to it, but uh, that's all. Do you, do you want to ask a question? Yeah. On the, like, for example, for the polls, if we were to vote no, we get it on the ballot, but some can turn around and pass it. Yeah, they can do that. There's kind of a political price to be paid for do, doing that. And so, like, the, Driver's licenses for illegal aliens. There's a political price to be paid on that. I'm not happy with everything that gets passed by the voters. So we have restrictions on using dogs to hunt cougars, but I don't take that on because that's what the voters passed, and I don't know if I want to face the wrath of voters. We have legalized marijuana, and I'm super not happy about that. But I try to do the best I can to say, okay, if you guys want legalized marijuana, because you told me you want to legalize marijuana, so if you, if you guys want to have that, that's fine. We're going to. I take care to make sure that that gets policed and regulated as much as possible there. On the um, administrative rule reform there, what that does is it creates a new constitutional provision that says that, and it has to be in the Constitution, because if it was not in the Constitution, it would be a violation of separation of powers. But what it says, whenever an agency, agency, the executive branch, right, uh, whenever an agency passes an administrative rule, if any 20 state representatives plus 10 senators sign a petition to suspend that uh, administrative rule. That administrative rule is suspended and is no longer in effect until it gets a hearing in both houses and gets passed by a majority in both houses there. So most administrative rules, like if they say they're going to give out 168 spike deer tags in the Sumter region in the year 2021, I, just, I don't know if that's the right number or not, but let's just go with it. So you know, I'm, just, I'm not going to fight that one. But if they say if they say administrative rule, we're gonna you know regulate carbon emissions somewhere, or someone's gonna be a big drain on business or something like that, then I might get a petition or self file. So that would be a, a big deal. But that one has to go in the constitution because it's a it's a checking, it's a new check and balance in the Oregon Constitution there, right? So I do want to say one more thing. Did you notice that there was one branch of government that's kind of missing in my whole presentation here? Did anybody kind of catch that? What? No, not the voters. No. It's one of the three branches that you learned for a schoolhouse rock, right? <laughs> Judicial, I didn't talk about that at all. So I'm afraid to talk about that. So the reason is, <laughs> no, not too afraid of judges and what they're going to do to me. I've been before judges. Those guys are decent. Anyway, the problem is, so what they did is they, they have really messed up the Oregon Constitution. They messed it up really bad on the judici judiciary. So they had, I think it's uh, Article 6 is the judiciary. And then they said, ah, oh, we need a bunch of changes to this. And they put in a whole bunch of amendments and they screwed it up. Not that they screwed up the law or the way it runs or anything like that, but they screwed it up the way they wrote it and the way that it interfaces with the original like that. So now you have the Article 6 is the judiciary um, original. And Article 6A is like the judiciary amend as amended or something like that. They had to keep the original in there. 
it's really, it's really, really, really bad. It's just, it's like the worst thing that you could have done. I mean, I could have done work at that. I mean, that might be mine. You know. But uh, anyway, so I did not talk about the judiciary. There's not that much interesting to say about the judiciary. We have the same three levels that we have in federal. We have in federal court, they call it the district court level there. In Oregon, we call it circuit court level. We have, and we have circuit court, we have each county has circuit court judges, and those are elected, unlike federal judges who are appointed, but we elect our judges. Or I'm going to say we elect our judges and put it in little air quotes like that, because we don't really elect our judges, because nobody runs against them, because the only way you can run against them is to be a lawyer, and if you're a lawyer, you're probably going to have to practice law in front of that judge someday, and that doesn't really make a good climate for running against them. And then the Oregon State Bar is tasked with ethics rules there. So I was, a long time ago, I was the chairman of the Polk County Republican Party, and we had a forum, a candidate forum, and we had some judicial candidates there. We actually did have two candidates running for a seat there. And we and every question we would ask them, they'd say, well, I can't answer that question, Twitter, because we'd ask them, you know, are you pro-life or whatever? Well, I can't answer that because someday I might have a, a case of it. So the Oregon State Bar has hamstrung them so that they can't even run for office anymore. So, uh, so they, we, we elect judges there. So that's at the circuit court level. We have the Oregon Court of Appeals at the next level. And the same thing we have in the, the United States, we have the, the circuit courts, right? So, uh, the ninth circuit court of appeals. We have regional appe appellate courts there. And uh, we have a statewide uh, uh, appellate court there. And then we have a Supreme Court, Supreme Court. So, um, so that's, that's how that works there. So I, I didn't talk, I didn't make any slides on that because like I said, I, just, I read that stuff and my eyes glaze over. It's really bad. If you want to see really bad work, that's one really bad work. Okay, that's all I have to say. And if anybody has, does anybody want to go up? Yeah, Rich. Let's say you're not talking about the health system. You're talking about the policy. How is that? How do we find out? Okay, so the, so we have a procedure for that. So I'm not responsible for that. I'm a state le legislator. I made the law in the first place there, and I'm not responsible for enforcing that law, and I'm not responsible for deciding what that law means. Once I pass that law, it's out of my control. If you if the if the Department of Human Services made an administrative rule that's a violation of that, then you need to take that to the courts. So you need to be a victim of that law and go sue. And that's the procedure we have for that. Not coming from not coming from my thing. The check and balance would be I could repass a law that makes it very clear what the law is or something like that. That's the only check and balance. But for the le the legislature kind of has a big heavy hand in that because we start the process, right? Judges can't write laws, right? We all know that, right? So judges <laughs> judges can't write laws. So I so I as a legislator, I'm in a minority party, so they don't let me write the laws very often. But but in theory, as a, the legislature writes the laws, and so we get to set the table there, and then the executive branch gets to implement that law and enforce that law, and then the judiciary gets to interpret that law. So I get to set the table, so the legislature kind of has a hand in that. Yeah. So the Attorney General can issue an opinion, and that's um, that has not quite force of law, but it's directive of what happens in law there. And the Attorney General will do that. So we'll pass a law and then people will say, well, what does this thing mean that Nehrman passed? We don't know. Or and then the Attorney General will say, in my opinion, this is what it means or whatever. And, and that will be that will be subordinate to a court case or a court case should come up. But sometimes they try to head off a court case that way. But um, as far as checks and balances, the legislature sets the table. And so we're kind of the first, first domino that falls there. And then if we don't like how the subsequent dominoes fall, we can make new dominoes fall that clarify with the, how the domino fall should have been, which is sometimes easier said than done. But uh, uh, anyway, but that's the process there. But I don't get to go back and say, no, 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 I'm Nehrman. I wrote that law, and you're doing it wrong. I don't get to do that. I just run a law, put it out there, and then it's got life of its own that way. That's not the process. <laughs> To write a new law. Yeah, that, that nullifies it and clarifies it and all the good stuff. Way in the back there, you had a question.
So two questions there. One was who oversees DHS? Okay, so the Department of Human Services is that's just government. I'm trying to think. I don't think they have a commission, do they? They don't ever hear of like a human services commission or anything like that. So I think that that's just just directly done by the government. One of the things the DHS is a huge. They have a huge budget, and uh, a lot of it is uh, federal pass through money. Um, and so um, so there's some things that the state has that are in there, and there's a, there's a lot of sub hives inside the DHS. So, but it's under the authority of the governor there. And then your question, your second question was, how does the attorney general investigate the DHS? So uh, the attorney general would have to do that on her own. So the attorney general is her own separate thing. And that would, that, that investigation would have to be um, uh, based on something criminal going on, I think. So um, uh, that, would, that would be how that happens. What? So, so you're talking about Kylie, and this is the um, the girl that uh, that they're um, forcing to have surgery or whatever. To um, uh, and it's questionable whether she needs surgery or whatever. Um, so, in that case, there. Um, I don't know if there's anything criminal going on there. And I'm gonna, so I, I think that the attorney general is um, is not gonna, is not having a problem with what's going on there. I think probably the attorney general's not on her side on this one. I don't think she's a big medical freedom crusader or anything like that. Probably a better thing, and uh, this is, to, so going back to Rich's point about checks and balances, is uh, the Ways and Means subcommittees, so I'm on Ways and Means subcommittees, and I'm, I'm on two different ways and means subcommittees, which mean I, means I oversee about two fifths of the agencies of the state of Oregon. And one of them is not DHS, but uh, the legislature does oversight on executive branch agencies. And we do that as part of their budget hearings. So we don't have to have a DHS. We don't have to care for foster kids. And we, we just kind of let that just go if we want, because we kind of are doing it anyway right now. But the, um, so, but we choose to do that as a legislature, and so we establish the legislature establishes the Department of Human Services, and we give them some money to achieve some of their missions or whatever. So we have oversight on that. So um, the uh, members of the Human Services Ways and Means Subcommittee would be people that could have, uh, um, when you say investigatory authority, that they could. They can, I don't want to call it an investigation, that's not quite what's going on here, but to call up the head of the Department of Human Services and say, hey, what's going on here? Can you explain why this was done? That's a very appropriate place for that to happen. So you might look, look the, that, that up and, and go that direction. I'd be happy to help you with that too. Yeah. Come see me afterwards. <laughs> that's what we do a lot in ways and means hearings is we say, Okay, come here and uh, explain what the heck on this or whatever or something. And uh, even in between the ways and means hearings, because we only get like a little bite of the apple once every six months, every two years, right? And so, uh, but stuff goes wrong throughout those that two-year period there. So the agencies that are uh, that I'm that I oversee in my ways and means committees there, during the course of the year, I'll write them and ask them questions. Say, hey. There's a problem here, you know. What are we going to do about this, or whatever? So I, I do that kind of stuff. So and that's appropriate, and that's a proper channel to do that. And um, we talk about like a uh, attorney general doing an investigation. First of all, I think that the current attorney general that we have is not really on our side, so I don't think she's going to cooperate with that. And then second of all, I just don't think that that the Kylie thing is not really criminal. It's kind of, it's just, it's a case that's being handled wrong. There's not really anything criminal there. Nobody's stealing or murdering or anything like that. So I, I, I just, yeah. Oh, okay, so maybe just kidding. But, but it, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's kind of an administrative thing. It's, it's a policy thing of why, why are you choosing to do things this way kind of thing rather than there's a law that's being broken that somebody committed a crime or whatever. So it's kind of more of a policy thing. Does that make sense or whatever? So, <laughs> yes, Terry. Would it be okay if I 
Yeah, yeah. So, so Terry's going to come up and he's going to make a little announcement here. And anybody else that has an uh, organization or, or uh, Jack, if you want to come up or whatever, you can, if you're running for office, you can say who you are. But yeah, I think you'll be able to hear me fine. I've got a loud voice. I'm uh, Terry Taylor. I'm running for Polk County Commissioner in Polk County. So if there's anybody from Polk County and you wonder what Terry Taylor looks like, this is him. This is like a theme for the day here. It's like uh, the Darth Vader <laughs> foot theme for the day here. <laughs> I ran, I ran up against a Democrat. <laughs> There's my partner right there. Yeah. You know, between the two of you, we got one good set of feet there. So. I'm Jack S. Jack L. S. I gotta be careful. I'm questioning on that last one. I'm running for state representative here in District 21, which is the greater Salem area. Uh, Sam Sapp over there is my campaign manager. We're out asking for votes, asking for help, and third and most important, guess what? You got it. Uh, last time I ran, I had twelve hundred and eighty-one dollars. Got thirty-seven percent of the vote. My opponent, Brian Clem, spent over seventy-four thousand. So it's just I've got to get some money in to run a decent race. I think he's beatable. Any yeah, questions? I'll be out back. One thing I'll point out to hear those numbers there. I think he said he had eighteen hundred dollars versus seventy thousand dollars there. So that's one of the reasons why it's very important to have a candidate run for these seats, not only because you win, but because it uh, it draws that money out and then you can't spend money trying to keep the so Oregon's Life is Oregon's largest pro-life nonprofit. So we are all about stopping abortion in the state, stopping euthanasia, stopping assisted suicide, and we're having our March for Life on this Saturday at 2 p.m. So you should come. Um, we live in a very pro-abortion state, unfortunately. And so we need to really show up, show the legislature that we are here, that we, the pro lifers exist in Oregon, and that we are a voice to be recognized. So, 2 p.m. at the Capitol, be there. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thanks everybody for coming tonight. And so we have one more. It's next Thursday, right? Is that right, Mindy? Yeah. So it's a week from today. And uh, did you want to say something? Reading from the Republican Party of Texas. Oh! <laughs> Good, thanks. Welcome back. And, uh, and tell the Republican Party of Texas greetings from, from uh, uh, here at the Oregon State Legislature in Green County. All right, good. So I think we're uh, we're done for tonight. We'll see you next week, maybe. So thanks for being here.